Hey, last week we talked a little bit about um, the, the thing that really makes our prayer uh, powerful and how, we talked a little bit from Romans 8 about how when we don't even know what to pray, the Spirit himself prays through us with groanings that words can't express and uh, there have been some varying interpretations of that I understand, but the key uh, that we focused on was that the, the Spirit of God always prays through us in accordance with not only God's word, but God's will. And so I want to uh, just kind of bridge off of that uh, tonight and look at a few passages of scripture and just encourage you um, with, the, with a, a, maybe a little different perspective in prayer. There, there are two kinds of prayer that are essential in our lives. And one of the things that leads to tremendous disappointment and discouragement is if we don't see the, the need for both of those and how they work in our lives. And so um, one of those is not just, most of us understand prayer as being focused toward specific temporary needs. Uh, and there is a, a place for that. But when, when you see in the New Testament, uh, the, the lifestyle and the pattern of Jesus, who's our ultimate example, um, the, it's always fascinated me in uh, Mark chapter one, right after he calls the disciples, says that uh, Jesus went into a village and the people heard that he was there. And so they brought to him all of the people in the surrounding area who were sick and uh, demon possessed and whatever and he healed them all it doesn't say he prayed for them it said he healed them and so he could have prayed whatever for their healing and that kind of thing but but most of us would would kind of say well what do you mean how do you how do you heal them if you don't pray for them well the people who are demon possessed don't need prayer for their demons they need them cast out and people that are struggling with sin issues in their flesh don't need their flesh cast out you can't cast out the flesh what they need is the the word of God imparted there and and working on that but here's the key it says uh, that he prayed for all of them he healed them late into the night and then the next verse says very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus went out to a solitary place to pray. To pray. You get it? So he wasn't praying for people. He was communing with the Father. He wasn't praying about anything. He was praying to the Father and receiving from the Father. Just him and the Father in this intimate communion. And so those two aspects of prayer that, that certainly we pray about stuff. But if we don't see the other essential of prayer as being keeping us communing in, in constant contact with the eternal one and eternity itself. It's where Jesus said in Matthew 16 that, uh, we, we would pray that uh, uh, um, the, the kingdom of God would come right here on the earth just as it is in heaven. Well, well, how do we know to do that? How do we know what that looks like? How do we know how to, unless we've been communicating with the eternal, we don't know how to bring eternity into our temporary situations. And the other side of that is if we only see prayer as 911, 911, God, I have an emergency. So, so, so I've done everything I can do about this. So I don't know what else to do. I'm just going to pray. Well, well, prayer needs to be our first response, not our last resort. And if we're communing with God and we're praying about situations and we don't get a specific answer, a specific response, uh, a specific word, maybe, hear me now, this is going to rattle some of you, maybe it's because God, 
who is eternal has an eternal perspective and to him it's not a crisis because God saw you before you had the need whatever it is and God sees all the way into your future and this is a little blip on the scale and God knows if it's a big blip God knows if it's a little blip and God knows how to blip the blip that you're blipping right now not bleeping that would be non-church words blip. are you with me here and so so many times what the enemy does to get us in fear or to get us in fleshly responses is to just destroy our perspective when we're communicating with the father the security that comes into our life is God's got this and that he's speaking comfort he's speaking affirmation in our life just like he did Jesus and so when we come to those times, you know, even Jesus had his crisis moment in the garden when he went and he began to pray and his soul was overwhelmed to the point of death because that's exactly what he was facing. And so I'm not saying that, that your problems aren't a big deal and that we're not to pray about it. We are to pray about it. But if Jesus hadn't been in communion intimately with the Father outside of praying for people and casting out demons and healing the sick and whatever we the the rest of that we see if he didn't know the father's heart he would have never made it out of the garden let alone to the cross see because he, he began to get the eternal perspective and the temporary agony that he was going through uh, it, he could face it with joy because he didn't just see the cross he saw the other side of the cross because the word says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. How did he do that? Because he knew both of those aspects of prayer. That he knew that the father was there always so he could call him anytime. In fact, he said that. Do you not think that I could call legions of angels and they would come? I mean, that was the temptation in the wilderness as he began his ministry. You know, here the enemy is. He's fasted for 40 days. He's hungry. Turn this stone to bread. Man doesn't live on bread alone. It wasn't this temporary deal of, man, I've fasted for 40 days. I don't know if I'm going to live for 41. And so all of a sudden, his whole life is focused on a rock that is now turning to a loaf of bread. And he's in this hallucinogenic state because the devil's right there. Wasn't a crisis to him because he had an eternal perspective. Man doesn't live on bread alone. I live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. And so his response brought him back into those realms of perspective where he could walk that through. And how many situations in our life would change if we could, uh, uh, or, or let me say it this way, how many crisis situations in our life that we could look back on now and not only see God's faithfulness, but realize it wasn't that big of a crisis. Now, now some of them are, I understand that. And, and the only thing that it does is just enhance the fact that, that in the midst of the crisis, God was right there walking us through it when we didn't even know what to do, when we didn't know how to react, when we got the phone call or the news or the whatever and the you know, we had to walk past the shock or the loss or the grief or the impact or the doctor's report or whatever it might be. I'm not minimizing what we walk through in our life. But what I'm saying is neither should we minimize the value of prayer and the access that we have to heaven constantly. Not just when we need it most, but when we deserve it least. That God is there. Right? Is that good? Everybody got it? You still love me and everything. All right, good. So, so here, I just want to look at a couple passages of scripture to, to emphasize this. John chapter one, uh, here John says, to, to kind of put this in perspective for us. Of course, the first part of that is awesome. Uh, I love the, the first chapter of John. Uh, talking about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and we uh, saw his glory 
the one from the Father, full of grace and truth, all of that. Most of us are familiar with it. What I want to focus on is uh, verse 29. Uh, after it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, it, it says the next day, uh, John, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one uh, I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I'll let you just chew on that tonight as you sleep. I myself, listen to this, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing was with water is so that he might be revealed to Israel. Because the way we know Jesus is not through knowledge, but through revelation. We, we don't know him by knowledge or the flesh, we know him by the spirit. And the way we get information spiritually is not through knowledge or information, but through revelation. It's the spiritual principle. It's always there. The one who was before, who came after me was before me and all of that. What, what is that? God just reveals. It's, he was already there because he's eternal. Okay. And God just reveals us the fact that he was already there or that he's already in the future or that he was there in our past. Revelation. It's something that you always knew but never realized. And the only way you know it is by the Spirit. Everybody with me? Verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Everybody say remain. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. How did John know that Jesus was the Son of God? Because the Spirit came down and remained on him. Now, even in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came down on people. It came even on Saul, and he prophesied. But it didn't remain on him. He only did it once, didn't do it consistently. And so here, the Spirit of God not only came down on Jesus, but remained on him. The anointing, the Holy Spirit, God's mark on his life, God's approval, uh, God's empowerment remained on him. Now flip over to John 14. We're talking about the spirit and the word and this, uh, the consistency, the eternal uh, aspect of that. Here, John 14 continues the testimony. Um, uh, let's see, we're looking at verse 15. Jesus is speaking to his disciples here and he said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. You'll obey my words, okay? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Uh, the, the word another means one of the exact same kind. Jesus is saying, uh, well, let's read the whole thing here for context. Jesus is speaking, if you love me, you will obey my words or what I command. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor or advocate or comforter to be with you forever. Note the connection. In John 1, John said, I wouldn't have known who the word of God, the son of God, the word made flesh was unless the spirit of God came down and remained on him. That, that was the consistent uh, aspect of it. Here Jesus says, I will give you another counselor, another uh, advocate. He will be with you forever. In other words, he will never leave you. The Spirit of Truth, capital S, a title, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Why? Because the world don't, doesn't see by the Spirit. The world doesn't walk in revelation. The world walks in information. 
to, to gain their knowledge. Tell me about you. And we'll start with, well, here's where I work and here's my family and here's the thing that doesn't m help them know you. That just means that you exchanged information about yourself with them. That knowledge uh, um, is the intimacy of relationship. And I don't mean that physically or sexually. It's the, the, the depth of spirit that that's how we know that there's no revelation that takes place until you walk with somebody and you get to know them and then you develop a trust and, and then even when you see their life may be inconsistent with what you've known, the, the, what's, what they've revealed to, about their life as you've walked with them or worked with them or whatever, lived with them, been married to them, is, is what you build that relationship on. Is everybody with me here? Okay, and so here Jesus says, uh, the world can't accept him the Holy Spirit, that this other counselor, because it neither sees him or knows him. But then he says, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them. Here we are. We went from word to spirit, back to word. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. All right, let me point out a couple things about uh, where I, I was before. Jesus is speaking. He said, you will obey my commands. You'll obey my word. I will ask the Father. He will give you another counselor, comforter, advocate. What, what translation are we using here? Is it counselor? Advocate, okay. Uh, actually, it should be capitalized. Uh, a capital C, a title for the Holy Spirit. But the word another uh, there, when Jesus used it, is the Greek word alos, which means one beside me, in addition to me, but just like me. It's, Jesus was saying, he will do in my absence what I would do if I were physically present with you. So he's not just saying that, that the Father will give you uh, a different guide, a different counselor, a different advocate. And the word there is parakletos or paraclete. It means one called alongside to help. Uh, somebody who advocates for you uh, in a legal sense, but somebody who walks with you, comforts you, comes alongside you uh, to, to give you not just advice, but in that sense of counselor, speaking to the deepest needs in your life, but uh, speaking to you as a friend, uh, counseling you, comforting you, is close to you. So in the, in the rough times and the joyous times or whatever, they, a, a great counselor doesn't just uh, speak truth when you mess up. A great counselor also uh, rejoices with you when you don't mess up. When, when you're having good days, uh, a, a good counselor is the one who walks with you, not just the one who says, well, I'll tell you what, stop by the office and for 200 bucks, I'll counsel you. That's a bad counselor. Uh, and I don't mean that to be derogatory toward professional counseling, but if that's the only time, then, then that relationship is a financial one, not just a spiritual one got quiet in the house. Maybe you've had too much counseling. All right. So, so here Jesus is saying that, that just as I've walked with you, just as you've known me, because the father revealed something to John, John declared it by the spirit that the way he knew me was after the spirit, not just after the flesh, because the spirit of God came down and remained on the word of God. 
And then Jesus talks through this aspect of here, here's Jesus in the flesh, but he's talking about what's the Father speaking to him eternally, but in the present. And he's speaking to them prophetically of what will happen while it's happening. So, so he's speaking about the fact that I'm with you and they're building this relationship and these guys uh, live with Jesus in close relationship for three and a half years and now Jesus is preparing them saying, I'm gonna go away. But he's already told them, I will never leave you or forsake you. So it's creating conflict. Wait a minute, you said you weren't going anywhere. And he said, but I'm not gonna leave you as orphans. I'm not abandoning you that, that the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit, another counselor, another advocate, one in the exact same kind. And the Holy Spirit is going to do uh, in you what I have been doing with you. He has been with you, but he will be in you. And then at the day of Pentecost, when Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was not only with them and was in them, but now he came upon them and empowered them and remained on them. Not just a temporary thing, but remained on them and it changed the world. That Jesus fulfilled what he had spoken, I will build my church upon the rock of revelation, not just Peter, a person, because God doesn't build it on the flesh, he builds it on the spirit. And, and they built it on the revelation of who, that Peter declared who Jesus was, Jesus declared who he was, and this revelation took place and launched forth. He didn't use a perfect man, he used an imperfect one with a perfect counselor, comforter, power source, the Holy Spirit, guiding him, bringing the whole thing together, and not bad, uh, that, that a guy who couldn't even keep his sandal out of his mouth, uh, his first sermon, 3,000 people get saved. I mean, that's even better than what I did. How, how about y'all? You know, 3,000 people got saved in your small group Sunday night and it was your first meeting. Awesome. Way to go. We don't have those testimonies. But God does when we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us. His word is always the guide. The Spirit never violates the word. Ever. Ever that it comes and empowers the word and remains on the word and vice versa. It's amazing to me that people use the word to, to deny the present power and working of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will be with you temporarily until that first wave of apostles passes away and then you're on your own. How ridiculous is that? Jesus said, he will be with you for how long? forever. Why? Because he's eternal. So here's two things that are eternal that we have access to constantly. God's word is eternal. It says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word won't pass away. The word lasts forever. And so the word is eternal. So when we pray the word, we're praying prayers that are reaching into the future and that are reaching into eternity. That it can literally, as we pray prayers based in the word, that we can uh, to change someone's eternal destiny because they believe the word, that they confess who the word really was in the power of the spirit through faith, Jesus Christ, the son of God, and I believe it in my heart that he is Lord, I confess with my mouth, that, that that's who he is and that's what I believe they shall be saved. It changes their eternal destiny. So the word is eternal and it works eternity in us. But the way we understand that is more than a set of rules or commandments or regulations where, by which we restrict people's lives is in the power of the spirit when the spirit of God comes upon the word of God like it did in John 1, literally upon Jesus. But here God takes his word and he puts his word in us, but he puts his spirit in us as well to activate that word so that here we are in temporary human bodies, frail flesh, but we have 
access and contact with eternity in our temporary human state. Think about that. That'll change your whole perspective on prayer right there. And the election and your frustration and everything else. By the way, if you want to know my opinion on the debate, there were three losers in that debate. Leadership lost, character lost, and the American people lost. Amen. That's all we're going to say about that tonight. Help us, Lord. That's why we need to pray with an eternal perspective. Yes, it is extremely important in the temporal. Um, but we need to pray much deeper than which person or which party wins. And we need to begin to pray the word of God. That everything that is hidden will be revealed. That uh, we speak the truth in love. That the character matters. That we honor uh, the, the word of God. That we uh, uh, let our yes be yes and our no be no unless we be condemned. That, that'll change the whole dynamic there. Here, let me finish up so we can pray. Uh, let's finish this up. John 15, next chapter. Jesus is still speaking to the same disciples that he began this long dialogue with in, in chapter 13. But he's already communicated to them about the Holy Spirit. Here's the last thing I want you to see. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine. Jesus, again, of course, speaking here to his disciples. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Uh, some translations use the word abide. Same meaning. This, this constant contact and connection with the life flow. And so here Jesus said just the, the same term as the Spirit of God came down and remained on him and uh, anointed and empowered that word. Now Jesus is personalizing it for the disciples here and saying the same transaction needs to happen. You need to remain in me and I will remain in you. You can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse five, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch uh, that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And he goes on to tell them, as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. He said, remain in the vine, stay connected to the life flow, remain in the word, let my words remain in you, and let that totally transform the, the whole realm of your prayer. Access eternity and let that word be released in prayer and you can ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. I've had people really struggle with that, that sometimes they get disappointed or at other times it's like uh, they haven't understood the connection with the word and the spirit and that, that uh, constant uh, access that we have to the eternal, but the, the constant impartation that God wants it to be in our lives. 
So we struggle with the temporary and the eternal. And I've had so many people say, well, pastor, it really doesn't mean that I can ask whatever I want. Well, not in a selfish way, no. Without it, the context that Jesus never said that. He said, if we remain in him and his word remains in us and the spirit is in us and the spirit is with us and the spirit is on us and we see Jesus example, then we're not gonna wanna pray something that's contrary to God's will or contrary to God's word or, or doesn't have the life of the spirit in it. We disconnect from the vine and we start asking God like a genie rubbing a lamp. Jesus doesn't appreciate that. Jesus didn't say, if you rub me, uh, you'll get what you want and I'll pop out of the, the lamp like a puff of smoke. He said, I'm already in you, I'm already imparting life, my spirit's in you, my word's in you, and so let that be the motivation for this prayer, not just in crisis situations, but in the communing times with the Father that we're downloading heaven and kingdom principles and we're not even aware of it. We're just over here having a, a love relationship with the Lord and he's loving on us and the Father's affirming us while the world's beating us up and so we come to the Father and he's counseling us, he's comforting us, the Holy Spirit's ministering to us, he's reminding us of everything Jesus said, he's stirring that word in us, he's empowering us because the Spirit is there and we're drawing access to that. And so here we are walking into temporary situations that seem like crises, but what the temporary situation doesn't understand is we've been in eternity. We've already been up to heaven not died and gone to heaven we just had access and we just downloaded heaven as we're walking into hell and and so we just let it out you know the world says give them hell i say give them heaven give them eternity give them the heart of the father because you've been in his presence and just and it's shocking to hear people say that of Come out of the world, be separate. We don't have to talk like the world, act like the world, be like the world. Don't respond. I, I saw today on the a news deal that there was a father on the way to the hospital to visit his newborn baby and uh, was on the highway and he was driving erratically. Of course, he was excited to get there and some other guy, he cut him off in traffic or something trying to get there and so the guy was a hothead and so there was a road rage incident and the guy shot him and killed him. A father on the way to the hospital to see his newborn child. And so that whole thing in an instant, now eternity has changed. And so you think, okay, how much remorse is some idiot hothead guy gonna have thinking, so really? those 20 seconds of delay or whatever, that instant I made that decision. See, and if we don't access eternity, then the temporary situations can explode and they can't be frustrating. I got frustrated today driving down 98. That's to me, they need to rename that highway, purgatory. You just enter in purgatory, just going through it, man, just kind of make it through. And so it's just, but that's in the flesh. And immediately I was like, man, that's not right. Because the Holy Spirit was like, look, you can get frustrated if you want. I had my salad. I was hungry. Actually, I was hangry. Very hangry. Do you get hangry? Angry when you get hungry? That's hangry. You can use that word. I made it up. And so, so there was there. Here I was coming. I was like late. It was like two o'clock. I mean, good Lord, I'm two hours late for lunch. And, and you're delaying it. So, so really, those few seconds, and it was right up there at the light. Th that would have made all the difference in the world. So I was like, okay, slowed down, hold over, didn't flash my lights, didn't make any lovely hand gestures. I, I just thought, Lord, I'm hungry. And then I thought about that scripture that I shared earlier. Here Jesus fasted 40 days and he's face to face with the enemy and he starts with a rock and a loaf of bread. Come on. See, when we face temporary situations with an eternal perspective, it changes everything. Peace 
we think that peace is the absence of conflict. Not true. Peace is not the absence of something. It's the presence of someone. And so if, if we access in our prayer time and we're not just wasting it going down through it, and I shouldn't say wasted it, but we're not spending our time in prayer going down through our list. Lord, I need this. Lord, I want this. Lord, do this. Lord, help me understand this. I'm praying about this. I'm praying for this person, this person, this person, this person. And my prayer is more targeted toward temporary situations that I'm aware of rather than in my presence, I put away my list. And I just say, Father, what do you want today? What, what do you want with me? And here's my schedule, and here's my life, and here's my stuff. But you know all that. So I don't even have to remind you. I just want to be with you. And Lord, my mind is going, and my heart's whatever. And so, so just... Help me focus on you. And, and for me, this morning, it was just a few minutes on the porch, and I'm thinking, I don't know, Lord. This is a temporary deal, but fall's kind of a big temporary deal to me. And it was a cool breeze, and I'm thinking, this kind of feels like fall. Don't trick me now. Don't, don't bring back summer. You know, and it, but I had that moment because I felt the heart of the Father was just, and that, then I felt this, just this affirmation that the Lord was like, I like that. I like you. And I'm thinking, I like you too. That's a wonderful thing. We were talking about uh, friendship in the men's uh, meeting Monday night, and Sandy was talking about a, a revelation where the, the, the father showed him that Jesus introduced him to the, the father. Do I get that right, Sandy? And he said, let me introduce you. Jesus said, let me introduce you to my friend, Sandy. To the father. And I'm thinking, man, I like that. So I was thinking about that this morning. I thought, Lord, would you introduce me like that? And it just, I felt like he just dropped it in my spirit. I just like being here with you. And it felt like he just kind of blew a little breeze on the porch and said, see, I can take care of it. Don't, don't worry about it. So, so I don't know, and I realize that, that some situations are huge. But, but those are the times that we need to access an eternal perspective the most. And we need to stay in the presence of the Lord until we see it his way, not till we can convince him to see it ours. Because we don't see it with an eternal perspective. He does. And so we just say, Lord, download it in my heart, download it in my spirit. Let me see it that way. Amen? Does that help you? Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. God, I thank you for your eternal word. I thank you for giving us, pouring out upon us, introducing us to the spirit, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, the one called alongside to help who's going to be with us forever. Eternal word, eternal spirit in our very temporary conditions. Father, tonight I pray that we would just access that. That we wouldn't read your word looking for a verse to plug into a hole in our soul or in a situation just looking for an answer. But God, we'd hear your voice in it speaking to us. Not just a prophet, not just a poet. Father, not just a historical context in your dealings with people. God, I pray that it, we would just receive it as the love letter that it is for our eternity. God, I pray that we would let your spirit work with our spirit. 
I pray, Lord, that we would just let our prayer come out of what we see with our natural eyes. That, Lord, truly we would ask for revelation. God, let the light of your word shine to reveal to us what's in the dark places. Father, reveal to us things that we can't know any other way. And God, I pray that your spirit would activate your eternal word in our hearts and in our lives. And God, it would bring that change and transformation in us. And then that you would let us be those eternal people living in a temporary human condition. Affecting humanity around us, God, with that same eternal perspective. Lord, I thank you for it, that we have all the power that we need. We have all the insight we need. We have all the life we need. We have all the answers that we need in your word. But the power of our prayer is only magnified when we spend that time communing with you. Then speaking into our situations, into our circumstances, into our needs, no matter how great they are, and being those that you've called us to be. Father, I thank you for it tonight. Pray that you just change our perspective, just make those adjustments in our hearts so that we can move forward to be more effective, be more powerful as the sons and daughters you've called us to be. As we just sit with the Father, we just commune with the Holy Spirit that we commune with your word Lord we practice that process of reading it but even doing what you commanded your prophets to do eating it re receiving it into ourselves processing it chewing it up tasting it participating actively with the word that we're reading. Father, I pray that it'd become much more than words on a page. It'd be the spirit of God, the voice of the Lord, speaking and working in our spirit, his eternal purposes and will and way. God, we thank you for it. We give you praise and glory and honor here tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, we have one more week uh, in our series on brokenness, uh, Sunday morning. And so uh, appreciate all the uh, positive feedback. Haven't gotten any negative so far. Appreciate that. Not that I'm close to that, but uh, it, that, that's encouraging. Uh, sometimes when you put it out there, it, it's, a little, it's a little risky. And so God's really used that uh, to, in some really unique ways, uh, connecting people and even people that don't go to the church, uh, some of you have encouraged them and, and they've tuned in, caught it online or whatever, and uh, it's really had an impact. So I appreciate that. And God wants to lead us through that so uh, we're not just uh, wallowing in our brokenness, but using that to let his light shine through. Amen. So glory to God. Be praying about that if you would and uh, bring somebody with you on Sunday and let's let the healing begin. Hallelujah.